three out of every hundred babies will be born with a birth defect. That means that something has gone amiss while that uh, embryo has been developing in the mother's womb. It may be a problem that has to do with the neurological system. It could be a problem that has to do with the limb system, that is the legs and the arms developing. It could be a problem that has to do with the heart system, but something about the architecture of that baby, as that baby's being put together, the building blocks for that baby are being put together in the womb, something goes awry, and that baby is born with a major birth defect. And three out of every hundred babies are born like that. Some of the birth defects are very serious. Even as recently as a hundred years ago, we thought that it might have, we thought that women would have babies that were born with birth defects because of maybe something they saw on the road as they were walking to an event. And we would then say, well, that mother saw such a catastrophic event that the embryo now has a birth defect. We know that not to be true, but it has taken hundreds of scientists throughout the world to try to uncover and identify certain factors that cause birth defects. Some of them we've already identified, like thalidomide. So in the 1950s and 1960s, when women were prescribed thalidomide for conditions in pregnancy, we found through uh, astute physicians talking to each other that some babies whose moms had taken thalidomide were born with shortening of their legs and arms. And many of you may have seen the pictures of babies with thalidomide. So in that case, we identified the problem and then we translated it into clinical care such that thalidomide was taken off the market so that no more babies could be born um, secondary, d born with defects that were secondary to thalidomide. There are other factors, sometimes we call them teratogens, that may be either in the environment or that may be part of a woman's underlying health conditions or maybe some medications that she's taking or maybe genetic susceptibilities um, that will also cause her to have birth defects. And some of them we have identified, some of those factors, and we have not yet translated them into clinical practice. For example, we know that uh, there are some defects of the immune system um, that will cause a woman to have a baby with a birth defect. Uh, rubella, for example. Um, and that is commonly known as German measles. If a mom contracts rubella while she's carrying the embryo, often those babies will have congenital rubella syndrome. So in most, but not all, countries of the world, we have translated that again into clinical practice so that our young infants and young children are immunized against rubella so that when those individuals come to the reproductive age, they will not be having rubella at a time when it could affect the developing embryo. We also know, for example, that when we look at a maternal diet, some of the uh, things that mom will ingest, either through her diet or through vitamin supplements, will help to protect that unborn baby. For example, folate. Folate is one of the key nutrients that really helps to protect a baby as a baby is developing. And folate is a fantastic uh, story about the importance and power of scientific discovery. Folate was discovered in the 1940s. In the 1960s, a group in um, Britain were able to determine that it would have folate deficiency would have a detrimental effect on the developing embryo, causing the baby to be born with defects such as neural tube defects, spina bifida, and anencephaly. By 1990s, there had been close to 10 or more studies that had been done that had such compelling results that the United States Public Health Service were, was able to say all women of reproductive age who are capable of becoming pregnant should take 400 micrograms of folic acid. And following on that, then there was uh, further information, further mandates from the Food and Drug Administration that mandated that foods, rice, grain, and cereal products be fortified with folic acid. 
Now, since that was done, in since mandatory fortification in 1998, the incidence of neural tube defects in the U.S. and in other countries has declined remarkably. That's a success story. What we are doing at the Arkansas Center for Birth Defects Research and Prevention is to participate in the discovery of other factors that will cause birth defects. We are looking further into folic acid, trying to understand not just the fact that folic acid can prevent against birth defects, but why it does that. If we can understand why folic acid works, we think that we will be able to harness that knowledge, that power to help us identify other causes and hopefully other preventative methods that we can use to prevent babies from being born with birth defects. So we are looking specifically into the association between folic acid metabolism and congenital heart defects. We are using tools of traditional epidemiology. We have been involved in the National Birth Defect Prevention Study since 1997. In that study, over 35,000 women have been interviewed, and we have enrolled both the mother, the father, and babies, babies who are born with birth defects. In addition, we also have been able to enroll women who have had healthy babies so that we compare the differences in terms of exposures and other susceptibility factors between women who have had babies with birth defects and um, women who have had healthy babies. We are using the tools of genomics and the Human Genome Project to really try to understand genetic susceptibilities in association with genetic factors. We know that within the 30,000 genes or more in the human population that there are several common variants that may lead one woman to be more susceptible to the effects of uh, smoking, for example, compared to another women, woman. We have discovered that women who are at a greater body mass index compared to women of normal weight are more likely to have a baby with a birth defect. But it's not all women who have greater BMI. It's only going to be some of those women. And we think that the, uh, the interaction between, for example, maternal weight and a genetic susceptibility will really uh, help us to put a piece of the puzzle together. As we make these new discoveries, then we hope our long-term goal is to translate these discoveries into clinical practice. So that when a woman goes into her reproductive years and begins her years of having a family, that she will be able to go to her healthcare provider and ask that provider how she can optimally work to have a healthy baby. With the knowledge that we gain through our discoveries of factors that cause babies to be born with birth defects, that knowledge will then inform the clinicians and public health providers about things that women should either increase, for example, folate in their diet, or identify factors that are going to be harmful to the developing baby. And so it is through a combined effort, not only of us here in Arkansas, but uh, with our collaborators throughout the United States and internationally, that we will continue to make these discoveries and translate them into clinical and public health initiatives.